Hello, I am Luba Vangelova. I am the founder of The Hub, which offers unique part-time cohort experiences for adolescents and can be found at www.thehub.community. And I am here today with Stephanie Sewell, who I will uh, let introduce herself. Hi, Luba. Thanks for having me join you this morning. So I am Stephanie Sewell. I'm in Chelsea, Quebec in Canada. And I have a teaching background. I also have a homeschooling parent background. So I currently work as an education consultant, helping people to find and navigate education paths that work for them and most importantly for their children or teens. I have two kids and they're currently 19 and 22 years old with very different educational paths themselves. All right. Um, so today we're going to talk about interest-led learning and what that means and how it fits into the larger um, bucket of customized learning. And so I was um, prompted to do this interview because I was recently asked by a parent why someone would want to have um, create a customized education for their child rather than just having them follow the standardized education that many of us have, you know, grew up with and that, you know, many kids still follow. Um, and it obviously made me realize that um, the reasons are obviously not self-evident, um, or at least, you know, not to everyone. So um, let's first talk about customized learning or personalized learning. I mean, sometimes one term is used, sometimes the other. And how, um, I mean, it seems to exist on a spectrum. Um, to some, it just means, you know, letting a child follow a curriculum, but, you know, just have some little amount of leeway <laughs> and all the way to no curriculum. So can you talk about, you know, kind of some of the differences, um, the different flavors of customizing an education? Yeah, I think it's it's a really important topic to address because that notion of, well, why would I want to offer my child a different opportunity than a standardized education provides? It's it's behind it's 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 very important to the decision making of a lot of families right now. You know, if children are struggling in school for one reason or another and they're having to figure out, well, what does it look like to remove them from school and to do something different, the first thing is to understand. Well, what, what on earth are we going to do if they're not at school? What does that mean for their education? So yeah, as you mentioned, uh, I would agree it exists on a spectrum of we're still essentially doing what's done at school, but we're doing it at home. So, you know, you can do it in your pajamas. Or you can start at 11 instead of nine or, you know, so the small variations like that, right down to, you know, radical unschooling where really a child is completely um, in charge of how they spend their time and absolutely pursuing their interests. So I think a number of things are important to consider. The, for me, we always start with well-being. So what is important to address in terms of the well-being of the child, but also of the family. So I see a lot of kids who know that they need to leave school. Their mental health is in tatters as a result of their school experience. But it's really stressful to them to think, I'm going to be falling behind. Like all my peers are advancing and you know they're doing all that math and whatever. And like the notion of falling behind adds to their anxiety and gets in the way of them moving through and healing whatever um, they were experiencing in their school experience. So for them, it may be very important to still know that they can follow a curriculum. And so then parents may be looking at, well, do we sign up for an online class or do we bring home the textbooks that they had while they were at school and use those textbooks? Yeah. Other kids, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, people who are on the autistic spe spectrum and may have a PDA diagnosis. For them, anything that is perceived as a demand and curriculum is essentially a demand, an invitation, a requirement to learn a particular thing, that in itself can be very detrimental. So those kids, even if they've just come out of school, the first thing they want to do is have nothing to do with any 
thing that is perceived as a demand. And in both cases, you're looking at what is the well-being of the child right now? What does that child need to start to heal and to start to thrive? So to me, the, the notion of you know, what is, like how do we do this interest-based learning? How do we do education? It all comes down to what does the child need right now? And a way of helping um, for people for whom that's a new idea, which is most of us, because most of us went to school and followed the school curriculum and graduated. And you know that's what we know to be usual in our current society. But if we think about young children when they're learning to walk or talk, it's easy for us to see that you know, all babies and toddlers do that in their own way, at their own pace. And that's kind of a, it's a very pure um, notion of lived learning. So if we think about that and think about, you know, a thousand babies or toddlers and what their walking or talking experience looks like, it can be an easy way to grasp the notion of interest-led, i.e. individualized, i.e. what do I need as a human being right now? It's easier to understand, well, of course it's different mm -hmm. and how it plays out looks different. Mm -hmm. And the notion of you know putting a thousand of these little ones into the same room and telling them, or into the same building, I guess, divided into rooms of 30 and saying, okay, you know, today we're all gonna learn to walk. Like it's, it's kind of laughable. And so we can start to draw links to how other schooling is done. And it's really just a question of opening up our ideas as adults, as parents, so that we can start to hone in on different aspects of our kids' lives and have the capacity to look at that through a different lens. And as I said, to me, the lens is usually the lens of well-being. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you you mention um, children who have had various types of um, struggles in school, but I mean, this idea applies to anyone. I mean, people who have been, you know, homeschooling from the beginning or people who um, may not, quote unquote, be, you know, struggling or um, having what would be considered obvious lack of well-being in a standardized environment, but maybe they're just not flourishing, right? Um, like it's not just, it applies, you know, I guess globally, right? Wouldn't you say to, to anyone, um, you know, and I mean, I would guess some people do, you know, are flourishing in a standardized environment. And if so, I mean, <laughs> no problem, right? Uh, I mean, would you say, um, you know, for whom is this like a good thing to consider? Maybe not vital, but a good thing to consider. I was so glad that you honed in on that for more clarity, because yes, I think you're, you're absolutely right. This is relevant to anybody and everybody. I'm gonna give an example to, to um, address that question. So when my son was six or seven homeschooling, um, you know, we had chosen to homeschool. It wasn't, there was no well-being issue. It was, it was just a natural extension of what his first years had been. And it felt very lovely and wonderful. And, you know, as a former teacher at that point, I was all excited about doing everything perfectly and figuring out all the best ways to teach him things. And, and I remember one day we were sitting down and I was teaching him how to add with two digits. So where you had to carry the tens. And, you know, I'd been lying in bed the night before thinking about how to explain it. And I was super excited and, and we were sitting down and, you know, so we had a bunch of these questions and he could do it all in his head. And I was like, but you know, like there's, there's a way to do it on paper and I'm gonna show it to you. And, and I could just feel the light dimming and as I tried to bring him into this like age appropriate curriculum oriented, but beautifully taught lesson that I had in mind. And that was a really important moment for me because I realized, yeah, I mean, I could have convinced him to learn it my way or the right way or the curriculum way, but in so doing, I was extinguishing something in him. Mm. So his interest his engagement with numbers was flourishing and he loved whatever was going on in his mind to add those numbers together mm -hmm. 
And my letting go of the should that I had around it allowed him to continue following that. Mm -hmm. And as I look back from the vantage point of many years later, I can see that he still carries that sense of, I can, I can, you know, I can play with numbers and I can see things and, and find, like he's now in computer science and in university. And like, I see him talking about coding and like the, just the way he approaches it. I can see it in that moment back when he was six or seven years old. So I think that interest based or individualized learning, it's not, it, it, yes, it's often about recreating well being, but it's about what would be, it's also about what would be lost if that wasn't allowed to carry through. So if you go back to, you know, the child learning to walk, if you're insistent on them doing it in a certain way at a certain time, what would be lost? And it may be their sense of, I am able, I am capable, I am seen by my important people for where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried to pull myself up on that table twice and I'm done. But if somebody's saying like, try again, try again, because then what kind of messaging is that giving? And, you know, we, we can jump to the other end of life and think about retirement. And what I, you know, I'm at an age where I'm starting to have friends who are retiring. And there's often that sense of like, well, what am I going to do? Like, I've always been told what to do because I worked in a job where I was always told what to do. And, and these empty days are a bit scary because they've lost or forgotten how to initiate for themselves. So I think this idea of individualized learning at the school age years kind of keeps that light alive. You know, babies absolutely know what they need for themselves. They have no problem showing it. And we can lose that thanks to curriculum or thanks to standardization. And so the more we can have this interest, this opportunity to truly be ourselves, the more that stays alive in us, which I think leads to lifelong well-being. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, so basically, um, in a sense, preventative medicine. I mean, if we look at it in kind of the well-being lens, um, kind of doing what you need to do to maintain health um, rather than necessarily to fix health. I like that, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I would just add to that that I you, you, you kind of mentioned the idea of somebody who's thriving in school. And I think that the, it, come, it comes back to how we think about learning and living. So if you've got somebody who is thriving in school, then it may be that they know that they're allowed to have a mental health day anytime they need to. It may be that they know that, yeah, I mean, things are taught in a certain way at school, but things could also be learned in another way. Like, so always understanding that you have agency, that you might choose to do something that appears to be standardized. Mm -hmm. You are choosing to do it. It's right. very different than not knowing that you have a choice. Right. It's the idea of consent, right? That we, mm -hmm. we aren't so much in the habit of talking about in, in learning. We're starting to talk about it, which is great, but we're very comfortable talking about it in terms of medicine, in terms of drugs, in terms of sexual activity. But it's that notion of what are you agreeing to? Therefore, what is your experience of it and of the uh -huh. um, interactions that are happening within it? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, so the contrast is not necessarily really so much between homeschooling and school. It's between, because a very structured standardized environment can also be applied in the home by a parent. Yeah. Um, so it's more that, um, you know, some kids may thrive with that, um, but you're saying um, often it's because they know that they are going along with it. Um, like it's not, they're not trapped. Like they, they don't have the feeling of being trapped in it and that can make a big difference. 
It's because with consent, an important, like you consent to, but you also need to be able to withdraw consent. Mm -hmm. So I think when somebody knows, you know, somebody chooses to go to school, but they know they can also choose to be a homeschooler or you know, not to not go to school. That's the game changer. Mm -hmm. And it means you can take from it what you want. Because I, you know, I remember um, my son went to a Montessori program for grade seven, and then he chose to return to homeschooling. And the Montessori program had a lot of, like, they were doing math out of a standard math textbook. And so for the first time, he had the experience of having to do a whole bunch of equations to practice something. And he came home saying, you know, there's there's value to that like I kind of I that way I don't have to I don't have to think about it in the same way like I still want to understand it but I'm just getting to practice it a bunch of times so I think I'm going to keep doing some math in that kind of way mm -hmm. so he had experienced it and then was choosing a very standardized mm -hmm. approach to it mm -hmm. as a tool mm -hmm. but at any point he knew he could stop doing that right so I think that's it, it yeah consent withdrawing consent and recognizing that things like school or elements of school or curriculum can be amazing tools mm -hmm. you know if you want to be a surgeon it's really helpful to have a well-developed curriculum to follow mm -hmm. to make sure you know everything you need to know when <laughs> there's a person open on the table in front of you right um so that's that's all um, very interesting uh, way to look at it. Um, and as Peter Gray has said, I mean, it was the title of one of his blog posts for Psychology Today, uh, something like the most fundamental right or power is the right to quit. Like knowing that, um, and quitting of course has negative connotations, but um, quitting can also be viewed through a different lens of pivoting <laughs> you know you, it's not like you're quitting everything i mean you are pivoting to something else <laughs> um that yeah. is maybe more suitable um yeah. so. and, it, and i think where i would die without going down too much of this rabbit hole i'll just briefly mention that um the quitting piece is often very complicated because a parent may have paid hundreds of dollars for a program. So quitting yeah. is losing that money. A child may have signed up for a team. So quitting means that team doesn't have that person anymore. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I, I really like to bring the well-being piece back into that as well. So to think about, okay, well, it, this desire to quit a program that we've paid for, what you know, what is the larger context of that? Is there something to be learned? And this is a discussion that we have with our children so that they can start to understand these bigger contexts around that type of decision. You know, what is the impact on the team? Might it be that you will choose to stay mm -hmm. until they can find somebody to replace you or, you know, whatever it is. So that's, yeah, that's my little brief blurb yes. on the notion of quitting. But yes, I agree that um, it can be a loaded term and it can also be very important to know that you can. Yeah, stop. yeah. Um, and so, okay, so we've talked about individualized um, learning or customized learning and how there's kind of a spectrum of that. Um, and I, I know the term or one of these terms, individualized, personalized, customized learning is used by a lot of, for instance, education technology platforms that, you know, they'll say they offer that, but, you know, what they mean is um, that you can go through the curriculum in whatever order you want, whatever pace you want, <laughs> and wherever you want to physically be located at whatever time of day, and so on. But, so that's one way to look at it. But then, okay, so then interest-led learning is also kind of a spectrum, though. I mean, um, because I know some parents can will consider interest led learning to be, um, you know, I want my child to learn X, Y, and Z, but in a way that can be like they, I will allow them to approach it through their interests as long as the outcome is them learning X, Y, and Z. Um, like, for instance, you know, I want them to be able to write essays 
but they can write the essay about basketball because that's what they're really interested in right now or whatever, uh, but they have to write an essay. And then other people will, you know, take it a step further and say, you know, their interest doesn't include wanting to learn to write essays right now. <laughs> um, so I will let uh, them guide the learning. So can you talk a bit about, um, you know, what role do the interests play and how much leeway is it reasonable for a parent to give a child? I mean, there are um, concerns, you know, uh, among parents that children don't have the perspective of knowing what they might need as adults and so on. And, you know, how much of a decision-making role you know, should each party play in that? So can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the role of interest and how far um, to go with that in your estimation? Um, you know, what, what advice do you give? I mean, obviously it's a very subjective thing, but what advice do you give to parents when you're consulting? I think that it depends. I'm going to come back to the well-being again. <laughs> um, so, we want to be able to have consent from our child from that. So if you believe that it's super important for your child to write, to learn to write essays because they're going to need this in the future. I mean, depending on what your homeschooling relationship has been, you maybe, maybe everybody has already consented to that kind of thing of like, okay, mom or dad is the one who knows what I should be learning and I'm okay with that. So they're telling me I need to learn to write an essay and I get to choose what topic, great, no problem. So that might be the case. Mm -hmm. If it's kind of coming out of left field, you know, I, I, I remember a homeschooling, um, a young woman I talked to one time, she said, yeah, we were totally unschoolers, but every now and then my mom would just panic and she'd like pull out all of the curricula that she had bought that we'd never used and say like, you have to do this. <laughs> So, you know, if you're in that kind of situation where you're mostly unschooling or purely interest led and suddenly you're having the sense, okay, they really need to learn to write an essay. It can actually backfire, I believe, to say, yeah, you have to write an essay, but like you can choose what you write it about because that's not true choice. It's not true autonomy. I think it's always better to be clear, like if, if for some reason you're requiring them to write an essay, the reason for that requirement, if it's not agreed upon, you're, you're stepping into a very difficult situation, whether you tell them what they have to write it about or whether they get to choose. And in some cases, you know, if they're grudgingly going to accept what you have to write an essay, they may prefer to be told what to write it about because they, if you're being made to do something against your will, you don't want to invest your special magic of how you feel about basketball into that experience because it kind of degrades your like it's not it's not a positive thing mm. so I think that's important is to recognize like you know is this something we just have to do and you know as you and I have discussed like sometimes you have to do it because there's an external requirement from whatever your government is and so then maybe it's like, okay, we just have to do it. The easiest thing to write an essay about might be what we grow in our backyard. Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. um, but get, so how much can you fully trust your child if you're, if you're operating in a more interest and child led context? I think that comes from what's your relationship with your child and what are they showing right now? So if you see that your child loves, you know, writing poetry and they love debating things, then you might be anyway, just because you're their parent and you love them, nothing to do with homeschooling. You might already be saying, oh, like I could see you might just be an amazing prof or an amazing lawyer one day. Like, I, you know, it's so neat to hear you. Like, those are the types of conversations that you would just have because you love them. And then that can come into, you know, lawyers actually wind up writing a lot of essays in law school. So we haven't done any of that yet. How do you feel about making that a focus for 
after Christmas or whatever it is. And then you're you're introducing it in a way that they can consent to. Mm -hmm. And then it, you just continue your conversation. Well, you know, it might be, we can go look at a bunch of essay topics that are typical to grade 10, which you would be in if you were in school. Do you want to do that? Or do you actually want to write an, a piece in essay format about something you love? And maybe you're going to wind up submitting that to the local newspaper and see if they'll, if they'll publish it. So it really can depend on the context. Mm -hmm. Have I answered your question? Yeah. I think I've gone wondering a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so... So let, if we can dig a little deeper into, well, let's, if we can back up a step, um, because you were saying, you know, you want consent. Um, can you just like, let, take a step back, take us a step back and say, um, why do we want consent? Is, is it um, because of what you were saying earlier about, what it does to initiative and so on, or is there more to it? I think when, when somebody is always, when their consent is always sought, a young person values themselves and sees that they are deserving of kind and proper treatment and you know all of the, all of the um, the strength that comes with knowing that you matter so to me that is the core of it it can sound exhausting or overwhelming to be thinking, well, I'm not going to ask my kid for consent every time, you know, I put my toddler into their car seat and like hold back their flailing hands to try to do up the seatbelt. But it's, I think it's a notion, right? Like even you might not explicitly have consent, but how, how you engage, how you, how you change your baby's diaper, you know, do you force their legs or do you like gently move them and kind of wait for them to go along with you? That consent, I think, pulls through into all kinds of aspects of education. If your child is at school and they've come home with homework and they're just feeling really tired, then consent is, is asking them, well, you know, what if you just do the first three questions? I'm happy to write a note to your teacher and let them know why it's done that way. It's that it's that kind of engagement with the person as a real person with real needs and and not just a kid who needs who can be told what to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a part of it. And then it's sort of linking back to the previous topic that we were discussing around what if you know as a parent you're just, you're fearful that they just don't want to do things and they're never going to learn to write an essay or you know, consent to something that you feel is really important. It, an interesting question to ask ourselves is if we continue to force, what kind of outcome might, might we achieve versus if we continue to allow space for conversation for our child to experience life, maybe we have to wait a few months, like, what and eventually they come to an understanding that yeah writing an essay might be a helpful thing to do or to consent to do what what are the two different outcomes how does how do they play out in our child's well-being and, and sense of self as they move through their childhood and into their adulthood mm -hmm. um so i mean uh that also, I mean, there, there's a lot of parental fear around quote unquote falling behind, but I mean, that's the subject for another later um, interview that um, I'm going to be doing, but um, so I don't wanna to get too much into that because that's a whole conversation unto itself, but um, okay, so, 
so what about the concerns of some parents that um that their children will make the wrong choices and they feel helpless just standing by and watching them make what they consider the wrong choices. Um, and I mean, they extrapolate into, you know, my child will never be able to <laughs> function as an adult <laughs> and, um, you know, will be dependent on me for their entire life and so on. Um, so how to overcome that uh, fear and is some of that fear sometimes justified and is there ever a time when you would say you know yes it, it would be okay to step in and start requiring things and and not just listening to the child's interests i agree that that's a very commonly held fear um so I think <clears throat> it can be very helpful for parents to learn as much as they can about outcomes of other families where there hasn't been a standardized education or you know, there's perhaps been more focus on interest-led anything because we're not used to seeing that. <clears throat> what we know is normal or good or usual comes from curriculum and requiring mandatory school attendance and all that kind of stuff. So if you're potentially considering something else or you're being strongly invited to consider something else because the requiring your child to do things is not working, then the first step is familiarize yourself with that word, that world to the extent that you can. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I would say. We get into situations where, you know, kids are <clears throat> refusing to come out of their bedrooms and you know there's very deep um, mental and physical health concerns that parents have those situations are outside the scope of my expertise to comment on but what I what I can comment on in those situations is for parents to take the time to think what is working can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So if they're behind, if they're staying in their room all the time, but every now and then they come out and they want to share something, well, that's amazing because they want to share something. So that sense of mm -hmm. having given them the space to be in their room and not be trying to get them out all the time might have given them the space to come to peace with something that allowed them to come and share. Mm -hmm. So maybe that moment of sharing is actually the seed that you're going to look back six months from now and go, that was when it started. That moment, that's when things started to turn around. Mm -hmm. So be watchful for seeds that may be getting planted, mm -hmm. that be careful that you don't overwater them and drown them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that's true with, with anything to do with learning you know we we have to be in a positive state in order to learn you know if you're we know this if people are feeling super anxious and stressed like you just can't learn I mean you might be able to hold information in your head for long enough to spit it out on a test but that's not learning in that sense so you know get, noticing what is happening that's positive and recognizing that if things are all negative if they're if a child is feeling so badly they won't be able to learn so it's it's kind of like looking at the environment you know if they're if they're refusing all um attempts to instruct them in something but they're spending lots of time on video games and you can see that they're learning how to work these games then you can kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, they're not learning what I expected them to learn, but they are learning this, which I can see as being the seed that will allow them to learn that mm. when they need to. Mm. Ah. So there's a lot of what lens can we look through what's happening at in order to understand it in a way that might show that there is growth happening here, even mm -hmm. though it's not obvious. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so that's, 
uh, interesting way to put it, um, they learn to play the video game and um, those skills that they used can then um, later be transferred to other things. Yeah. Um, so yes, because I, I see this often in um, parenting groups on Facebook, um, people will say, you know, parents will say, um, my child has no interests. <laughs> I can't do interest-led learning because my child has no interests. And then sometimes in the very next paragraph, they'll mention all they wanted to do the other night was watch hours of documentaries on YouTube. <laughs> it's like, um, didn't you just say that they have no interest? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, what you mean is they're not interested in what you want them to be interested in at the time, you know, at the point in time at which you want them to be interested in it. It's not that they have zero interests. Um, but, um, yeah. So back for one second. Yeah. 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 Interestingly, I think that that's a great example of where a parent, if, if you have those subjects in your mind and it, you, know, you have like a piece of paper in the kitchen that you just go and look at every now and then, it's like math, history, English, French, whatever it is. And you can have the discipline to say, okay, all they're doing is watching those stupid documentaries again. Take yourself away from that. Go to your piece of paper that says, you know, math. Okay, is there anything they were just doing that I could see through the lens of math? Is there anything I could see through the lens of English? And it's amazing how often you can put down a couple of examples in each of the main core mm -hmm. curriculum areas, which is a hugely relieving activity to parents who are understandably feeling anxious that their kid isn't doing what they think they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all the, th you know, we, we talk about in the workplace, people are looking for self-starters and like, but a kid who's like scrolling through YouTube, looking, like choosing videos to watch, that's self-starting, <laughs> right? So it's, it's just not what we're used to thinking that looks like. And part of that is because our world has changed so, so much from like our generation to our kids' generation. Mm -hmm. We just, we just don't know how to see things anymore mm -hmm. in the new way. So inviting ourselves into the practice of seeing through the lens we think we need to look through and what we're used to looking through, seeing what they're doing can be incredibly helpful for us, for our well-being, <laughs> mm -hmm. and therefore for our kids' well-being. All right. Um, and so... What do you see as the role of the parent then? I mean, if if um, if there's interest based learning, um, like how much steering, directing, providing resources, you know, what? How do you define the role of the parent? I think that, I can't remember who it is now. It might be um, Gordon Newfeld who talks about parents as being gardeners at one stage, and like he has different. Anyway, so I think that the parent is quite often like a gardener. Mm. Um, and I like to use that analogy because, as I said earlier, one of the most important things to be aware of is the risk of overwatering and therefore killing <laughs> an interest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that um, our role is to notice what's happening. Mm. Notice what your kid is into. Mm -hmm. And as you start to offer them ways of developing that interest continue to be observant so for example if your child wants to play piano and they're saying like I really want to play piano and you think awesome I'm going to sign them up for a year of piano lessons and then two weeks in they're saying I don't want to be doing all these boring scales or finger exercises that's not my thing that's you want to be continuing to listen to that so following their interests and continuing to be aware of how they are engaging mm -hmm. with the opportunities that you offer them. Mm -hmm. A really important phrase is, would you like some help with that? Or is there something I can do to help you with that? And it's really important to be able to hear and know. Because as parents who are choosing to be super involved with our kids, 
because they're not at school, we're, you know, we're choosing this extra time and, and engagement. We often super keen. It's like my my son in that math moment, right? Where I was trying to teach him so perfectly. But that that um, enthusiasm has the risk of dampening their own enthusiasm mm. because we start taking up the space that belongs to them. You know, if a child shares with you a precious, I, I saw this video and it was really interesting to me. That's like, you've just been handed this beautiful gift and engaging with it gently and always you know, remembering to step back and notice like, are they starting to blank over because I'm, you know, turning a fire hose of enthusiasm on them? Have I just taken, they, they were just a little interested and now I've offered to sign them up for five different classes. <laughs> so, yeah. I, and I know, I know this because I've done it. <laughs> um, so always be reflective in that way as well, I think. Mm -hmm. So offering, but not imposing. Offering, but not imposing. Yeah, and, and not, and being, mindful that your own enthusiasm doesn't yeah. take over don't suffocate yeah. yeah remembering that they're a person sometimes it's, it's really interesting to think well if this if this conversation were happening with me and my friend rather than me and my child uh, how would yeah. I engage like that's a, right. that's a really interesting checkpoint for for parents that... I, particularly so as the parent of young adults yes um it's useful for any age Right. Um, very good point. All right. And um, so also, I mean, one thing that um, is probably worth touching on is how there are seasons in life and um, learning. I mean, it can, you know, like, um, it, it's not like some straight linear path necessarily. Um, and just because there are times maybe, you know, when quote unquote, nothing seems to be happening. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, is it kind of like physical growth spurts in your a kind of observation, um, that there are similar types of spurts in learning? Absolutely. And I think, you know, an easy way to think about it is seeds under the ground, right? Like there's, we can't see anything happening, mm -hmm. but there's lots going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, you know, if we, if we come back to our own experience as adults, we know that there are times like you just, there are days when you just don't want to do anything or, or months when a project that you were super excited about, you just can't find the enthusiasm for it. And we can, choose to honor that for ourselves and we if we give our kids the space to honor that then again they they know what it is to be seen and to they get to have that experience of of having a a lull they might be experiencing it as a lull or maybe they're experiencing it as like I'm so full in my brain it's just nothing showing right now like every by getting to experience that in the safety of uh, being held in a family and their parents loving them and looking after them then they know how to have that and how to come out of it. Um, whether it. Whether they were experiencing it as a positive or a negative moment, they can have that coming out of it, which will stand them in good stead as they move into their adult years as well. Okay. And so do you recommend basically kind of following any and all interests wherever they lead? I mean, do you, do you recommend, I mean, you, you mentioned something about um, at the very, very beginning, uh, the first thing you said that I actually, uh, that I took a note on specifically was um, looking at things through the well-being of the child and the family, like the parents' well-being <laughs> also needs to be taken into account, I took that to mean. Um, so if a parent is feeling, you know, starting to feel anxious, nervous, and um I mean, you, you mentioned they can kind of educate themselves on, you know, some of the outcomes. And actually, if, if you could just really quick, um, do you have a favorite resource? I know Jeremy Stewart did a documentary, I think, called Unschoolers or something about grown um, unschoolers. Um, 
Do you have any resources for that you point parents to, like just to name one, to see outcomes of people that went down an interest-led path? Well, one of my favorite ones is um, Kate Robinson. You recognize the last name. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, she has a, what is it called? A, um, a go-to lecture? No, it's, it has the word go in it. I can't remember. And she talks about her experience of leaving school at oh, age, okay. 15 or 16. And, you know, she doesn't mention whose daughter she is. Um, so there's there, that's a really interesting one that I think can really help. Uh, I have a list that I share with parents, okay. and I'll be happy to share that list with you, and you can okay. link to it from from the podcast for sure. All right. And for those who don't know, um, she would be the daughter of Sir Ken Robinson, yes, who did you. a very famous TED talk um, about um, creativity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just remembered it's the Do Lectures, not the Go Lectures. D O the Do Lectures. Um, okay. There's actually a number of really interesting lectures in that series. But yeah, she so she spoke there. There's also been a number of um, panel discussions from the Liberated Learners Network yes. with, yes. gro with growing or grown um, unschoolers. Right. Yes, yes the Liberated Learners um, webinars, definitely I would fall into that category. Um, and so, um, so do you recommend basically following all interests um, and just trusting that those will lead to an outcome that will suit that child as an adult or how much do you recommend trying to steer especially if the parent is starting to worry that their child is like I don't know spending all their time on something that they just cannot you know they've tried looking through the lens of you know whatever subjects or whatever things you know are evident in this activity but they've kind of reached a dead end and they feel like, okay. Um, I mean, I know like, for instance, there was um, a child at, it was either um, Summerhill in the UK or Sudbury Valley School in the US, which are schools without curricula for, for our viewers. I know, you know, <laughs> um, uh, schools without curricular standards requirements, et cetera. And I think there was one boy who just wanted to spend all his time fishing. <laughs> um, I think that was the boy who actually ended up becoming a management consultant. <laughs> I think it was at, at uh, Summerhill in the UK. And he finally learned to read at age 19 and traveled the world and ended up becoming like an industrial engineering management consultant or some, something like that. Um, but like, um, at what point, you know, so do you just recommend to parents to trust the process, even if they cannot for the life of them envision? I mean, who could envision you know, that someone who spent, you know, the majority of their teen years would end up being, you know, a global uh, consultant, right? Um, that's a little hard for anyone to kind of <laughs> extrapolate. Um, so, so, so what do you recommend typically? It's, that's a great example, and I hadn't heard that example. Um, so I think that the more we're in relationship with our kids, the more we can have helpful conversations with them that can address that kind of situation. So if you've got a kid who's fishing and doing nothing else, but you see that that kid is like deeply happy mm -hmm. and healthy physically healthy like you know looking through this lens it may it maybe that's like another layer of uh, school thinking that you are being invited to strip off to think okay like if it, I, one of the things i'll often say to family to families who are struggling with like how do, what do we do with our child right now is when you first held that baby in your arms when you first met your child what did you want for them and it was probably something along the lines of to be happy, healthy, and independent. Mm -hmm. So that kid who's sitting there fishing for years, if that kid is happy, healthy, and independent, perhaps they've actually already achieved what you wanted for them and everything else that's in your brain <clears throat> is clutter. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly difficult to actually um, feel that and live that. Because obviously there's going to be all kinds of people around you who are saying um, <laughs> there may be a problem here. 
so you know most situations aren't that extreme mm -hmm. yeah but i think it, it really comes back to how do you feel this kid is doing mm -hmm. you know and and in the conversation you know if they're maybe there's a really good reason they're doing that and they're able to verbalize that one of the things i've seen is kids who have you know often kids who are on the spectrum who may have some challenges um, connecting with kids of their age they once they hit like 20 25 suddenly they can connect like the expectations around it are different there it's it makes sense to be with older people or younger people and if you look back over their teen years you there might've been a lot of concern around them not really being engaged with their peer group, but it was like a phase of dormancy because the world mm. made more sense for them in terms of their ability to connect with others once they got into a different age range. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking in those kinds of terms, but the more you can, I think it's okay to say to your child, it's usually, I mean, I can think of situations where you wouldn't want to say this, but they're, it's often okay to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm noticing that you're not choosing to ever read a book. Is there something in there that we want that, you know, we need to look at? Like, are you feeling stressed because you don't know how to read yet? Is there something I can do to help you with that? How are you experiencing navigating the world without being able to read? And when, when your conversation is from a place of trusting them and seeing them, and valuing what they have to say and being honest about your own um, concerns, which may be like everybody else is like, you know, I can share that with you. Like I'm concerned because I see everybody else is. Then you, I, I think there's a lot of trust you can have in your ability to together with your child work that out and see what makes sense. Mm -hmm. And coming back to where you started that question of the parents' well-being, it is absolutely okay and important for the parents' well-being to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's just before a parent says to a child, I need you to learn to read because I'm getting so much hassle, like I can't take it anymore. You have to learn to read for my well-being. That's a tricky situation where you would, I would invite the parent to step back a little bit further or dig a little bit deeper into you know, what is your well-being needing right now. But when it comes to things like, you know, if a child wants to do 10 different activities every week, because those are their interests, and that means you're going to do nothing but drive, that's a solid example of, you know, that's not meeting everybody's well-being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Balancing that. <clears throat> and again, that's so helpful, right? Because that way the child is getting practiced at understanding that other people have needs too. We live... You know, mm. unless like if you're going to go fish all day and nobody needs to do anything for you then yeah it's truly you but if somebody else needs to do something for you then mm. getting to getting to practice what it looks like to respect that mm -hmm. is important as well okay and uh just real quick um if we could just end um this on the note of what different outcomes do you observe um, and kind of focusing on kind of um, not outliers, but kind of the bulk of the population um, that you've worked with or seen <clears throat> as a teacher versus <clears throat> a parent and so on um, and a consultant? What differences in outcomes do you see when there is a shift made toward more interest-led learning. And I mean, acknowledging that it's it doesn't have to be, you know, a binary thing, like either it's interest-led learning or it's completely not interest-led learning. I mean, you know, there's the whole spectrum in between, but um, as people shift more toward more interest-led learning, what sort of outcome differences do you see? What, what is different in the child? I was hoping you were going to say in the relationship because <laughs> okay <laughs> no no it's all good <laughs> um what i see is different is the child is happier the child is 
they're more themselves. They feel safer to be themselves. They're not, there isn't this anxiety of having to um, fit into some uh, uh, to boxes, curriculum boxes, schedule boxes that others have imposed on them. Even if they seem to be fine in those boxes, mm -hmm. once they can let go of them, you see this sort of shining, mm -hmm. which in turn has a really positive impact on the relationship between the parent and the child. Mm -hmm. Parents no longer have their main role is like, gotta get the homework done, get out the door in the morning, like whatever you're letting go of, you've let go of it. And that means that that space in your relationship can be filled with something else. Mm -hmm. And as you start to see your child start to relax a little bit or you know be able to share an interest you start to see your child as another human more as opposed to a responsibility mm -hmm. and there's this beautiful um it's like a falling in love like it's really it's really beautiful to see I mean, I've I've heard like one parent I just remember her saying I trust my daughter I really trust her. And like every, everything was chaos. It was like they were in a really difficult crisis situation. But through that, she had already been able to glimpse, I trust my daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a glow of love. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, it's a real beauty. It's a real beauty that emerges. And right. beauty, beauty just makes the world a better place all around. And that is a good place to end. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, can you just mention if people want to get in touch with you, where they can reach you? Yes, for sure. I have a website, which is stephaniesewell.ca. I'm also on Facebook and LinkedIn under Stephanie Sewell Education in both those places. All right. Thank you. My pleasure.